Hey, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. In this video, it shows how to make these deceptively simple puzzle blocks that turn into equally deceptive pyramids like this when the puzzle's solved. If you're new to the channel, you're probably wondering how a video that shows how to make simple puzzle pieces ends up being an hour long. If this isn't your first Next Level Carpentry video, you already know that, just like a good puzzle, there's a lot more than meets the eye to build videos here on the channel. The build for these is challenging, and once solved, these puzzles make an interesting conversation piece if kept on a desk, shelf, or table. And I want to thank Paul Wire, my longtime friend, for inspiring me years ago with a batch of puzzles that he made up as gifts for family and friends. Thanks, Paul. Who knew way back then that that inspiration would end up here, right? And I think it's a fine idea to carry on Paul's tradition because I think that these pyramid puzzles are ideal Christmas gifts for family, friends, peers, or yourself. From initial milling through this fine final finish, the video guides you through the somewhat tricky process of making these blocks. I made all of these from pallet wood, but regular wood or scraps work just as well. The pieces you'll learn to make look like this one complete, and two of these three pieces, when positioned just so, look like this when you solve the puzzle. And what you'll learn is that there's a big difference between making these puzzle pieces and actually solving the puzzle. Although these blocks are very basic and appear simple to make, because the angles are 60 and 30 degrees and not 45 degrees, making these cuts precisely and safely gets a little involved. Because there's a lot of steps involved in making these blocks, I've added these timestamps to guide you through the build so that you can revisit parts of the process as you go through it. Or to just simply skip through the video to watch what's meaningful to you. After all, not everyone needs to know how to run triangular pieces like this through a thickness planer, right? You'll also find clickable timestamp links in the video description for your convenience in navigating through this chapter list. Yeah, you're right. Few people are going to want to spend an hour learning how to make a puzzle without first wanting to see it solved to show why they should. And that's why I've included a spoiler at the end of the video that shows how to solve this instantly so you can decide if you're up for the challenge. Even if you have no expectation of making these puzzles or don't have the tools or wood to make them with, I think you'll find the fixtures and process I use to make these tricky shapes fairly interesting. Well, you made it through this long introduction, so I think you'll do fine with the rest of the video, but I best quit yattering and get to work because puzzles like this don't make themselves, right? Thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. Uh, wait, I already did that part. Sorry. I wanted to show you what the wood looked like um, that you saw in the intro there for the um, pyramid blocks. And this is what it looks like. These are uh, pallet runners in various states of um, ugliness. And this is what this stuff looks like before going through the milling process. And I could go through a whole video itself on squaring up crooked lumber like this. But you can see some of that in the pallet wood video series. So I'm just going to clean these pieces up and get them all nice and square so that they're a consistent size. These pieces are for the pyramid blocks. This one is for a V block that you're going to see. And this one is for a push block that you'll also see. But I'll come back when these pieces are trued up and squared up and ready to be made into pyramid puzzles. In a nutshell, squaring up these blocks involves using the joiner, the table saw, and the thickness planer. I start out by making sure the fence on the joiner is dead square, and then I flatten one face and one edge on each of the blocks before taking them to the table saw. On the table saw, I'm using a thin kerf rip blade without a blade stabilizer to get maximum depth of cut. And I use that to true up the opposing face and the opposing edge on each block so that all four surfaces are parallel. And the blocks are approximately the same size. To finish up, I run each of the pieces through the thickness planer to make sure all the surfaces are smooth and parallel and the blocks are equally sized. With that bit of millwork, I've got all these rugged pieces of pallet runner all trued up, squared up, parallel, and they only snap like that when they're true. No twist, no cup, no bow, no warp, no runs, no hits, no one on base. So I'll make a couple of comments uh, about that process. I'm making big, aggressive cuts, deep cuts. That blade's uh, almost three inches set up. 
and I'm using this push stick. I got a video for these um, professional push sticks, and I can get the leverage and the, the positive grip that I need to push those pieces through while making those heavy cuts. I'm not using little twigs with a bird's mouth in the end, and that's important because when making a cut that's that big and that aggressive, there's a lot of back pressure on the blade. Uh, even with a thin curved blade, that's not brand new. It's pretty sharp, but it makes these cuts without too much trouble. And you saw when I was making the taller cuts, I just lowered the blade to a little over half and then flipped the pieces because the blade isn't tall enough to get all the way through these when they're standing up, only when they're laying down. And it's no big deal to make that double cut to sever these pieces off the faces here. And with a thin curved blade, um, there's not much scrap and there's not so much waste as with other methods. Uh, the second thing that ripping these down, ripping that third or fourth face down on the saw is it removes this dirty edge. If I run this through the thickness planer, even though I've scrubbed these with a wire brush and scraped them with a sharp putty knife, there can still be grit and dirt in there that dulls the knives on the uh, planer. But if I'm cutting this off on the table saw, that the saw blade is just encountering uh, fresh sterile wood inside there. So I use the saw anytime I can to cut those faces off rather than multiple passes in the thickness planer. So all this stuff is ready to go. Like I said, this is the, going to be a push block. This is going to be a V block. I'll set those aside and talk about these four pieces here that turn in to the pyramid puzzles you saw in the video thumbnail and introduction. The pieces I have for this video ended up at just a frog's hair under two and a half inches by a frog's hair over three inches. And with the nature of an equilateral triangle, where all the angles are 30 or 60 degrees, I'm just using this stair protractor to lay out a triangle from this edge of the piece. And you can see with that layout, there's quite a bit of waste here, and I'm not capitalizing on this size of block. If, if the block was closer to this size here, then that's the way I would lay out these triangles. And if I go this direction off of this face, you can see that the point doesn't uh, come out on the block, but it still yields a bigger triangle. So I'm just gonna shift this in like this so that the tip of that triangle fits within this block of wood. So these are the saw cuts I'm going to make. That bit shows you why I'm doing what I'm doing. So now I'll show you what I'm actually doing. And that is to divide the width of this block in half with that as the center line and then drawing that 60 degree angle from the center point down each direction so that everything is centered up on the end of the block as I make saw cuts on these two lines. What I'm about to show you can easily be considered an advanced technique for cutting these angles on here. The depth of cut is over two and a half inches. Other people at this stage will go to a bandsaw and make these cuts. In a lot of ways, that's safer. I'm comfortable doing it this way. I'll show you the setup I use. If you have a bandsaw and you feel better about that, by all means, use that saw. If you're not comfortable with this, just watch the video and buy some of these at a gift shop. So I need to make, make these cuts at 30 degrees, 30 degree tilt. It's actually a 60 degree angle, depending on how you measure it. And I'm not gonna use a zero clearance insert for this. I could slip this out and put a dedicated 30 degree insert in there, but I don't want to because it's not necessary. I'll mention again that I'm not using a blade stabilizer on this because it's not really necessary for this cut. And more importantly, it limits the depth of cut and I need everything I can get. I'm setting the blade to a 30 degree tilt using a guide block that I cut on the miter saw. And then I lock this setting in place. And naturally at this point in the video, a number of viewers are gonna say, you need to get an electronic Wixie angle finder to set your blade. It's the only way to set the angle on a blade. So go ahead and make the comment. Thank you. Um, Yes, I could get one, I could use one, but I don't, and I don't really want to, because this works. It's analog, no batteries required, it's foolproof, and it works every time. 
All right, so the next step here is to cut the first 30 degree angle on this. And you can see I have just barely enough blade height to make this cut, which is cool because I'm getting the maximum size puzzle out of the block that my equipment is capable of with standard setups. And it's difficult to get this to show up in the camera, but naturally I'm setting the saw's kerf to the scrap side of the pencil layout mark I have for this side of this equilateral triangle. And I'm going to stress this again. This is easily considered an advanced technique. The amount of blade that's exposed. I don't have saw stop. I don't have a riving knife. I'm comfortable making this, but because of the advanced nature of it, if you're not comfortable, just don't do this. One thing that I'm making sure here is that I have enough space between the blade and the fence as I'm making this cut so I don't cut the end off my push stick and defeat its purpose and get shot in the belly with a maple projectile. I'm not going to start up the dust processor for this cut, but I'm going to show you what this looks like making this 30 degree bevel rip cut. Slick as a whistle, perfectly straight and true, and that's because of the fact that the block itself was true when I started out with this cut. The advanced nature of this demands that the rip fence is parallel to the blade. The saw has enough horsepower. You got a good push stick. The blade is sharp enough to get through this. There's also the chance that on some pieces you could get binding as this cut's made because it's such a big piece that could pinch the blade and really encourage kickback. So make sure that you're standing aside. If your piece comes out, all you do is wreck the toolbox, not your uh, spleen. But um, yeah, that's what that cut looks like. And because all my blanks are the same size, I'll make that same cut on all these pieces. I'll mention here that the orientation of the cut on the grain of the wood determines what these faces are going to look like. I like to see a lot of grain in here, and so I try to orient the pieces. Sometimes it makes a difference if you cut the triangle this way or this way. It's just something to consider by looking at the end grain when you're planning the triangle layout. Another thing I'll mention is that if the block you're using is perfectly square, like in using a 4x4, you can get a slightly bigger equilateral triangle if you rotate it slightly in the end of that square. But it's a bunch of extra steps and a bunch of extra fussing around for a slightly bigger triangle. And to me, it's not worth it. And on these rectangular pieces, this is an optimum size for the triangle I'll get from the piece that I have to work with. Which is yet one more wonderful thing about these particular perfect pellet runners. If you want to see the video where I pick this stuff up, it's in the link. I'll stick it over there. Check it out. I put an outfeed roller stand in place for these longer pieces because I don't want them to drop off as they can lever past the outfeed edge of the table saw. This isn't super critical, but I'll add a center line and an angle line on the opposite end of this block for aligning the next cut. And that gives me a precise mark for blade alignment when I set the saw up to rip the other angle on this triangle. If making that first bevel cut is an advanced technique, then making the second bevel cut is advanced or still for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that the knife sharp corner that we just made on this piece now can slide under any gap in the rip fence. I can partially offset that problem by clamping the fence down to minimize that, but I still don't like it because of the chance of that piece catching or dragging or sliding under and making the second cut inaccurate. And truth be told, if that was the only problem, I would probably set about doing it that way and just be careful with my feed rate. But the second problem was actually more of an issue, and that is because we cut this piece off of here, I've got nowhere for my push stick to push past the blade. The saw blade is going to cut this to a point. If I try to put my push stick here, it's just very marginal, sketchy, how that's going to push. I might be able to solve that problem by making a wider push stick or one with a special angle on the bottom. But I've come up with another solution for this. Initially, I was going to use a dedicated push block, but when I 
thought about the logistics of that, showing it on video, and then implying that viewers could do the same thing. I'm just not comfortable with that idea, so I'm abandoning the push block method. And I'm particularly fond of the solution I came up with for making the second bevel cut, because I feel it puts it back to the same skill, comfort, and safety level of making the first cut. And a solution that I felt was rather elegant for the problem at hand, and it involves taking the scrap piece that I cut from this piece in the last sequence. Here again, if you don't like the idea, or if you have a bandsaw and know how to make these cuts safely on a bandsaw, go ahead and do that. Making the blocks after the second cut is made is pretty routine. So if you choose to use a different sequence than I do for getting this uh, equilateral triangle cut out of a rectangular block of wood, go for it and then just pick up at the next step where any divergent paths come back together. And I'll begin by lowering the blade to make this setup. To make this setup safely, place the workpiece snugly up against the fence and then take the off cut and put it back in the same orientation that it came off when it was cut. Now I use a snappy bit and an inch and a quarter long screw to fasten the off cut back to the workpiece. I'm putting the screw holes very near the end so that spoilage to the workpiece is kept to a minimum. I'm drilling at an angle so that the screw goes about 90 degrees to the surface of the workpiece and I'm countersinking the hole enough so that the screw head doesn't protrude. And I'm wishing I had a magnetic tip for this just now. Naturally, I do the same at the opposite end of the piece. And on both ends, I'm making sure that the offcut is positioned accurately on the side of the workpiece so that the sharp point of the offcut doesn't push the workpiece away from the fence. And keeping that screw at 90 degrees keeps tightening the screw from wanting to force this offcut up against the fence. So I hope you can see all that in the camera. But now I've solved two problems. The sharp point will no longer go under the fence because I've got this big flat surface. And I've restored a place for the push stick for making this cut. Naturally, I'm using short screws so they won't get hit by the blade while making the cut. So now all I need to do is raise up the blade, set the fence, and make the cut. I notice as I'm getting ready to move the rib fence that I've got a little bit of a feathery edge sticking up here. Just shows up in a couple spots. So I'm just going to take one of my best blocks for demanding sanding and knock that edge off so that the piece feeds smoothly. And then I'll use this small gauge to verify that the piece is equal width all the way along because ultimately this width is what determines where that second angle cut goes. And now it's rinse, lather, repeat to rip that second angle on the rest of the puzzle piece blanks. And I'll point out that I'm able to rip off defects from some of these pieces depending on the orientation of the triangle on the blank. So that's something to keep in mind in the planning process. And you don't have to be a rocket surgeon to think this through and realize that these offcuts aren't really waste. They could be glued together to make a whole nother batch of triangles, slightly smaller in size, or you can make an additional cut on these scraps to make a whole batch of smaller equilateral triangles for much smaller puzzles out of all that scrap. And I'm well aware that quite a few people would just cut these pieces to length as it is right now and then set about sanding to remove all the saw marks and burn marks from that ripping process. But anybody that watches Next Level Carpentry videos knows how much I hate sanding. So the next set of steps is going to reduce the amount of sanding to get a wonderfully smooth finish on these blocks with a minimum of sanding. In my lifelong quest to avoid sanding, I've learned the two best ways to minimize it. And the first method is the 96 cuts per inch that I get out of my DW735 thickness planer. A light pass over a surface, remove saw marks and burn marks in a heartbeat 
so that I can start with 150 grit sandpaper to clean things up rather than starting at 80 grit and working my way through. The only problem is a thickness planer isn't set up to plane one surface smooth on an equilateral triangle. So I'm going to show all the sanding averse people in the world the workaround that I use to eliminate burn marks, saw marks, and sanding in one fell swoop. And that workaround is a dedicated planer sled that's easy to make and easier to use. And I'll start out with this last chunk of wood that I milled true and square earlier in the video. So I'll take you over to the bench to go through a few layout steps for making that sled. I'll start out by marking the center of the block. I want to leave a fair amount of wood at the point of this V so the fixture is stable. And I'm going with about three quarters of an inch here and then marking those two 30 degree lines for cuts I'll make on the table saw next. The saw is still set at the same 30 degree angle I used for ripping the blanks. So I just have to lower the blade depth for cutting this notch and then set the fence for making the two cuts. The first to cut is standard procedure, but for the second cut, I switched to a custom push stick with an extended heel so that the offcut triangle from the middle of this blank doesn't come shooting out like an unwelcome arrow. I raise the blade ever so slightly and make a second pass on both angles to make sure that the puzzle block blanks fit down in the groove without interruption on their sharp apex point. And look at that, more triangles for more puzzle pieces still. But that completes the planing fixture that I'll use for smoothing up these blanks. And I'll take this opportunity to ask viewers if you like the kind of content you're seeing in this video, the unusual in-depth workflow and methods that I use for creating something as ordinary as a little pyramid puzzle, that I hope you'll subscribe to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. The channel has been growing steadily throughout the year, which is awesome, and I'm still optimistic that I'll hit the goal of 250,000 subscribers by the end of 2020, but that's just one short month away. So I hope anybody that's watching that likes this sort of video will hit that subscribe button and do me a favor to hit that channel growth goal. While you're at it, hit that thumbs up button to let the quants over there at YouTube know that there's plenty of activity here at Next Level Carpentry. All the various revenue sources I use at Next Level Carpentry to support the channel are all bombarding me with things about promoting sales and this and that for Christmas, for Cyber Monday, Black Friday and all that. But I don't want to get into all that hype. So I'll just mention that there's links in the video description for Amazon, Teespring, Patreon and PayPal. If you want to support the channel and or need some of the tools you see me using here in this video. I'll add a special note. I've recently added Amazon.ca for Canadian viewers in an attempt to help you guys find the stuff I use here if you can't find it locally. If there's something you want to see at Amazon.ca that I've not listed yet, send me an email or a comment. I'll get it posted there and hopefully that's mutually beneficial. So for all that stuff, check links in the video description and I'll get back to work. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. Uh, yo, Matt, sorry, um, you already said that before. What? Yeah, this is the third time. You're kidding. Three times? Sorry, man, but I guess somebody needs to tell you. Well, the good thing is the fixture is coming out great and those puzzle blocks are going to be cool when you get them done. So carry on. Well, thanks for letting me know, Chip. I think I'm going to have to try to get a little more rest in the future. <laughs> See you later. Good grief. <sighs> Where was I? Um, okay, well, yes, uh, making the V block is the difficult part but using the fixture is the easy part. But first, I want to smooth off and wax the underside of this fixture so it slides easily through the planer. First, I take a couple quick passes on the bottom of the fixture with a sharpened putty knife to remove any roughness in the wood. And that putty knife works a bit like a card scraper to smooth the surface. The best way I know to apply a heavy coat of wax to a machine top or a fixture like this is to prepare a rag with a glob of wax. I simply scoop a glob of this Johnson's paste wax onto a clean rag and then twist it into a ball until the wax comes through the pores. Then it's ready to apply a generous coat of paste wax to any surface that needs it. A heavy coat of wax on the bottom of this planing fixture will help it slide effortlessly over the platened in the thickness planer while I'm planing these puzzle pieces. And after a minute or so of drying, I buff off the excess wax and you can see this fixture slides effortlessly even across the top of my work surface and even more so across the platen in the thickness planer. 
And when I'm done, I just take the wax glob in the rag and store it in an extra empty wax can for future use. And I can always recharge it with more wax as necessary. And Johnson's Pace Wax is actually not a sponsor of this video. To make sure that I plane all three faces of each one of these blanks, I add squiggle marks to each face so that I can keep track of them during the planing process. With the bottom of the fixture smooth and waxed, and the inside of the fixture rough with saw cuts and no wax, I can just put these work pieces in the fixture and feed them through the thickness planer. If there's any issues with the, the work piece sliding independent of the fixture, I'll just add a stop block at the back or the front of this fixture so that they feed through together. It's important that the fixture be as long or longer than each of the work pieces. Uh, this one's a little bit long, but because of its overall length, I'm sure it will be fine. If it was a problem, I could trim a couple inches off the end so that it carries through. But the overall size of the pieces should make it work out. I wouldn't want to cut these pieces very short and feed them through the planer because they could kick up or get caught up in those rollers and create a di disaster. If I was doing a couple of shorter pieces, I would put them in the jig and glue them together with some Starbond CA glue so that they acted as one piece. They could be planed safely and then snapped apart afterwards. And because each one of these blanks has this little flat spot from the cutting process, I'm going to start with the same face that will be to my left of that flat spot and run that through the planer first. This is one of those all that for this moments in woodworking where I've gone through all these steps to get to this place merely to perform a simple planing function. Uh, I labeled these faces one, two, and three just so I can keep, an orga keep them organized. It's not all that critical, but I kind of want to have a process so that I get everything planed because this is an equilateral triangle. If, as long as I run each of the pieces through on each of the faces, they'll all end up identical in size when the planing's done. Even if I end up doing two passes on one face, as long as I do two passes on one face of all of them with the equal number of passes, they'll come out the same size. So what you'll see me do here, I'm not going to turn the dust processor on for this. I'll, uh, I'm dropping this piece on the fixture with number one is up. I'll start the planer, lower the cutter head until it engages the workpiece and starts the plane. I'll let it pull through the machine at that light pass. I'll lower the crank another quarter of a turn and then feed the piece through. That way I know surface number one is planed the same all the way through and then I'll follow up with each of the other pieces so the first surface is planed on each one. That's a lot of verbiage for a simple process, but I hope it explains what I'm doing and why it works. That first pass on each of those faces was pretty heavy. And if you look close, that flat spot is gone, so I've taken quite a bit off. And now if I rotate this so face number two is facing up, it shouldn't take anything off of that because it's an equilateral triangle. But I'll run it through once with the number two facing up, then I'll lower the crank a quarter of a turn uh, to clean up that face. You can see that the first pass didn't even take off the squiggle marks, but I lowered the cutter head a quarter of a turn, which is a 64th of an inch, and it cleaned off the squiggle marks, all plain, flat, smooth, and clean. So I've got surface one and two plain clean. I'll end up doing the third surface with one more 64th of an inch pass, so the whole thing's cleaned up. But I'm getting a lot of shavings in here, so I'm going to fire up the dust processor and get all the pieces done on that second face to get them all caught up. I should mention that you don't want to let chips build up in here because any chips that hold this piece up will 
throw off the final dimension. Now that I've got two sides done on each of the pieces, you can see where this is going. I've got face number three to clean up, another 64th of an inch pass. We'll get that done. And you can see that these things are coming out razor sharp. I've got to be careful so I don't cut my finger on those edges. But everything's all planed and cleaned up, ready for a scrape and sanding. But I'll get this third pass done first. And as the last one comes out of the planer, you can see the precision of these pieces when they're stacked next to each other. Every facet of each piece is absolutely identical with crisp and razor sharp corners. And I can adapt the same V block to other size blanks. This is the piece that I cut out of there. It's too small and the planer wouldn't touch it. But I can fix that by adding a couple of pads in here. Just a couple of quarter inch strips. That way this piece sticks up enough so I can clean it up with a planer if I want to make some small puzzles out of a scrap like this. Kind of fun. And I did say the planing process would minimize sanding, not eliminate it, right? So once these blanks have come from the planer, I'm going to do the initial sanding on all these edges because it's easier to sand them when they're in long pieces. And I've got a five-step process for doing that. The first one is to take one of my best blocks for demanding sanding. I'm going to take 100 grit and I'll use that to knock down the corners because these things are razor sharp. And razor sharp isn't good for a toy. Add a few wipes like that, take the sharpness off those corners, and give it a nice, consistent, smooth feel. Next, I'll use a sharpened putty knife to scrape mill marks off the surface of this because the knives in my planer are not perfect right now and they leave little ribs on the wood. And a sharpened putty knife is a whole lot faster at removing those ribs than sanding. But I do need to add a stop block in here to make this work out. And you can see that, that the edge of that putty knife pulls up shavings much like a card scraper would, but it's quick and easy to do. And you can check out this classy level five taping knife and you'll see more about these in upcoming videos but for now I'll use it for the second step I'm cleaning up these blanks and that handful of shavings right there represents about five times as much effort that it would take to remove them with sandpaper the third step in this process is a piece of 150 grit sandpaper on the stiff sanding block. And I use the 150 grit on the sanding block to go over those sharp corners once again to make them smoother. Next step is 220 on a gator sanding block. This has got a little bit of a pad to it, which gives a nice smooth sanded surface. And I'm doing the corners with the 220 as I go around the block in a little more efficient process. The fifth and final step is to use 320 grit paper to sand that wood. I just use this by hand. And using that 320 grit 
at this stage just makes it so much easier to get that smooth as silk feel to the wood. And I've just saved myself a boatload of time by sanding this to this stage before cutting these blocks up into puzzle pieces. I'm going to jump back in here with a couple of pro tips to talk about. Uh, you can see where the shavings are getting me. But I've obviously got a fair amount of time invested in making these blanks. And lo and behold, because this is pallet wood, there's some cracks and crevices in here, some defects. And I don't want to scrap a whole section of this piece because of the time invested. So I'm going to make a couple repairs. Viewers have seen me doing this before. I'm using Starbond uh, CA glue and their accelerator. I've got three viscosities, thick, medium, and thin. And I'm told by Starbond that they've made a slight adjustment to the formula of the thick to give it a little faster cure time. I don't know if I'll be able to tell that on this piece or if I'll even use it, but those are some of the things that come into play. So I think it's worthwhile to demonstrate that pieces like this can be saved, come out looking great with the use of a little Starbond glue. As long as I'm doing a plug in the video description, there is a discount code NLC for 15% off any Starbond products. I'm not pushing the products, I'm pushing the purpose. The stuff is awesome and uh, you'll see why. And you can see these defects when I zoom in with the camera. So what I'll do is first shoot the area with the accelerator. Kind of gives the whole system a head start. Uh, with the size of these gaps, I'm going to start out with the medium viscosity and just kind of wick it in the, to those spots. You'll see it soak down in, it just runs down in there. If the crack was smaller, I'd start out with the thin viscosity, but this stuff is thinner than water. It really goes in there, it would all just disappear. And I want a little bit of body in this crack so it'll fill up. You can see in some of these spots, if that shows up in the camera, where the medium has disappeared. I'll give it another spritz of the accelerator and then switch to the thick to kind of plug that leak. I don't use the thick in the first place because I want that joint primed with the thinner viscosity running down in there, but I don't want to keep it running forever. So I switch from thick to medium. Here's a little skinny crack, so I'm going to start out with thin on this one. You can see that water thin viscosity just soaks right down in there. And this is oak and the, the grain of oak is porous enough that this thin will just soak down into oak even if it doesn't have a crack in it. But you can see it soaking and curing as I'm going. There's a little puff of smoke from that thin because the accelerated cure time. And I guess this is how I get off on a rabbit trail that takes us deep in the weeds. I'm just sanding a block and here I go. Uh, when you're using the CA glue, Starbond comes with two nozzles for every bottle, which is great. But it's still a good practice to get into to wipe the nozzle before you put it away after each use so that two nozzles isn't enough. I usually get about a half a bottle dispensed, switch out the nozzle and proceed. But that's all uh, set up and curing there. Because the repairs are so thick, I kind of went hasty. Uh, I'll give these a little extra time to set up just a couple minutes and jump back in to show you how I smooth this off. Well, I spent the time while that glue is drying to finish sanding up these other blanks to the 320. And that leads me to the next pro tip. If you're like me and you need to wear glasses and they get kind of dusted up when working around that dust, just take a dryer sheet and dust those lenses. It takes the dust off of them. And something about the anti-static property keeps new dust from clinging on there in uh, any kind of a hurry. So another little pro tip from the next level carpentry shop. And that extra time there uh, gave this CA glue plenty of time to set up good and stiff. So I'm going to tackle that. And a common approach would just be to take a sanding block and get after it. I don't like that because it gums up the sandpaper. A regular sanding block just rounds a bump like that off. You might think I'll use a putty knife and scrape it off. But that's a little too aggressive of a cut and it tends to just chip some of that dried or hardened CA glue out of there and I have to add another coat. So my step number 5A is this metal file. It's got a special kind of teeth on there. They're nice and sharp, but they also won't file anything if it's perfectly flat. 
All this file does is, start, is shave things that are sticking up, like the CA glue. You can see right here, the file just slides and does nothing. It doesn't scratch the wood or anything. But once I put it on this CA glue that's sticking up, it starts to shave it off. You can see the shavings here. It just curls up on those sharp little curved teeth on this dead flat file face. And it doesn't take many licks. The file's filled up and the hump from the CA glue is mostly gone. But more importantly, all the little variations and bumps are out of there. So now I'll resort to the sharpened putty knife to scrape off the rest. And you can see that sharpened putty knife just cuts that CA glue off, right even with the surface. You can see these shavings here. Those are razor thin shavings of CA glue next to the wood it's stuck to. There's the results of the shavings. When it turns to wood and not CA glue, I know I'm done. And those cracks are all filled in, even though you can kind of see them. Once this gets a clear finish on it, which I'll demonstrate with this alcohol. Those just look like grain lines in the wood, but they're not the sort of flaw that catches a fingernail or gives splinters. So I hope you can see the value in taking a few steps uh, to resurrect a whole section of this material that if I cut into that and it just splintered off, it would just go to waste. But now that I've got those defects filled and the sanding done all the pieces, I can go to the next step, which is to cut these to size. With the last of that sanding to 320 grit on all four of these blanks, the last step is the most fun step, and that is cutting the puzzle pieces to size. Each puzzle is made up of two pieces cut identically, so they're universal and interchangeable. And I'm going to do that cutting on the miter saw because with the size of these particular pyramids, it's beyond the reach of the table saw blade without a special setup. And I really like the miter saw for making smooth, clean, accurate cuts for this part. When the puzzle pieces are cut and put together to form the pyramid, one face of the equilateral triangle gets covered more than the other two. So I like to optimize and pick the two best looking faces of each of these pieces and use those for the exposed faces. And the blank or bland uh, face here ends up being inside the puzzle. I think you'll see what I mean in a minute. But the reason I marked that face is to orient the cuts. And the typical way to cut this would be to put that face flat up against the fence and make a 30 degree angle cut to cut that off. And that's certainly doable, but I don't like cutting into the grain on this. I'd much prefer to cut this way, cutting with the grain or off the grain. It makes a smoother cut on the end and wouldn't you know it, means less sanding. But as you can see, the piece doesn't reference easily to make the cut this direction and make this surface here perpendicular, which is what it would need to be. So once again, I'm going to use our V block to make these cuts because it will hold the piece firmly in place for accurate repetitive cuts. And to make this setup a little bit easier, I'll just screw the V block to the fence on the miter saw to hold it in a constant position. I'm leaving it long enough so that the end will get trimmed off with the first cut. And all it takes is one strategically placed screw to hold the fence in place. And with that simple setup, I can make perfect cuts on each end of each block and use the end of the fence as a cut reference line when I cut the pieces. And I'm going to start with this maple blank using this as the flat backside. So that'll be out when the cut is made. And I can cut right to the end of this point without any trouble. And you'll see that the screw hole that I made for making the second bevel cut on this block will get cut right off into the scrap first time around. And I just want to hold this firmly in position with my thumb, which is easy because the inside of this isn't waxed and the piece virtually sticks in place.
I'm sure I already mentioned it, but each puzzle is made up of two identical pieces and the length of the piece is determined by using the width of one face of the equilateral triangle as the measurement for the bottom cut on the other piece. I have to go to the bench to mark this. And to mark the cut line on this piece, I simply take another one of the equilateral triangle blanks, lay it on top like that, flush up this side with a block of wood like so, and then mark carefully in the plane of the face on the other side. And as it turns out, the bottom of this puzzle piece comes out a perfect square. So now I need to make this cut on the miter saw. Back at the miter saw, I'll use the scrap that was cut off the end of the V-block to support the long end of this piece as I slide it into approximate position. And then I can use a squeeze grip clamp to hold the piece in place as I dial in the position of the block for the cut. This is the other reason I like cutting the piece in this orientation because I can clearly see this pencil mark on the bottom. It's easy to cut to compared to making a pencil mark on the long point of the puzzle piece. Once I'm satisfied with the position of the block, I can tighten the clamp and then draw a mark on the V block to the exact length that each puzzle piece needs to be cut. And then like everything else, the actual cut is a piece of cake because we did our homework even though the off cut goes crashing to the floor. Back at the bench, I used the other puzzle blank and a square to double check my cut length and I can see that it's just a skosh too long. So I'll make a trimming cut at the miter box and adjust the length mark I made on the V-block. And the amount of this puzzle piece that's sticking past the end of the V-block is the amount that needs to be trimmed off. So I can change the mark on the inside of the V-block for cutting subsequent pieces. And now you can see that this piece is perfect. Back at the miter saw, I removed the V-block from the fence, cut a bigger scrap off the other end, and just attach it to the other fence on the miter saw to make handling the offset piece a little more predictable and a lot safer. Now I need to reverse the angle cut of this block to make the next puzzle piece. I could orient it like this and minimize the waist, but because I want to keep the two show faces oriented to the outside, of the puzzle. I'm going to cut this at this angle, just reverse that miter cut. And there's a serendipitous outcome to this. When I flip the piece to reverse the cut, the scrap that it produces, that's actually another standalone pyramid, which makes it a pretty cool scrap. I'm aligning the very long point of that top angle with the cut on the V-block, which will give me consistent results on these little serendipitous scrap pyramids. One cut reversed, one little pyramid. And on the next ones, I'll adjust the length of the cutoff to compensate for the blade so that the pyramid comes to a point instead of this little angled top. Now, cutting more puzzle pieces is just a matter of rinse, lather, repeat, because I've got a precise mark for the length of the pieces. That's a little more like it. And I've got to keep the saw guard from binding up during the cut. So I hold it up out of place. And with the clamp in place to hold the piece, my fingers are well out of the way of this cut. Another perfect puzzle piece, just like that. And I can use this offset clamping bar system for getting one more cool little pyramid off the end of this puzzle blank. And that's the best one yet. To prove a point that I learned when I'm making these videos too, you'll see that I've incorporated a second clamp to hold the cutoff piece in place to keep it from crashing to the floor and embarrassing me for my technique. Much, much better, wouldn't you agree? With the fixture in place, the exact length determined, and the process in place, slicing up the rest of the blanks is pretty much routine. And again, doing your homework up front means you get precision at this stage of the game. I think you'd have to call that a veritable pyramid puzzle production operation, wouldn't you? Well, I've got to say that if the most fun part of this build is cutting all these little blocks, well, then the most unfun part is sanding the ends, which is what I've got to do next. But I better get to it, because it's not going to get done by itself.
best way to get through any sanding project is to come up with a system. So my system for sanding the ends of these blocks is to first use one of my best blocks for demanding sanding to knock the sharp corners off that were made when the blocks were cut. I'm using a 120 grit belt this time to ease the sharp edges and corners to make the blocks more user friendly to handle. And a sharp 120 grit belt gets this job done in seconds. Next, I clamp a piece of equilateral scrap in the bottom of the V-block and then clamp the V-block in the vise so that it holds the puzzle piece firmly at a comfortable working height. Step one is to use 150 grit sandpaper on the hand block to remove the saw marks from this cut face. Because my saw blade is new and sharp and this is fresh sandpaper on the block, it doesn't take that much effort to remove those slight saw marks. After making sure all the saw marks are gone with the 150 grit, I switch to 220 to remove the 150 grit scratches. If you notice, I sanded first with the 150 grit at this angle, then I switched to this angle with the 220 grit so I can tell when one scratch is replaced by the other. Before flipping the block to sand the other end, I hit it with the 320 grit sandpaper for that wonderfully smooth finish. Then I give the corners a once over two to complete this end of the block so that it's smooth, scratch free, and proud. Now I flip the block end for end and it's rinse, lather, repeat. And you can see that having that little system in place isn't too bad and it doesn't take very long at all to sand one of these blocks. But the trouble is I've got a whole lot more than one block to sand. So why don't you take a break? I'm going to go to work and get more of these pieces sanded before applying a finish. FYI, I use the same sanding sequence for the small four-sided pyramid scraps, starting out with the 120 grit belt on the sharp corners and using the V-block in the vise. But because the angles are different, I cut a different angle on the end of the scrap to clamp it in place and get a better hold on this block. And then I just work through the sanding grits to finish up the piece. And unfortunately, because of their small size, these are actually harder to sand than the bigger pieces. But a few minutes of focused effort gets the job done. Well, I gotta say that I'm always thankful when the sanding part is over, because that means I get to put a finish on the finished product. In this case, that means a coat of gel varnish on these blocks that I sanded. And I did one pyramid and one puzzle of each, oak, maple, and cherry. We'll get those coated up with some fantastic Old Masters gel poly. And a lot of you have seen me use this Old Masters gel poly before, but if you haven't, you're in for a treat. I do like the Venom Steel nitrile gloves. You can kind of find these again. Seems like they caught off with the... Uh, Drain on the system from COVID. Good gloves, you can get these low, at Lowe's or Amazon. Maybe you can't get them at Amazon yet. But that works good. Got gel poly in a can. This is the clear satin, which is a nice sheen for this kind of a project. I think I'll hit the cherry one first. And keep in mind that these have been sanded to 320 grit which is about as fine as you need to go. You could go 400 to 500 if you want, but there's a kind of a law of diminishing returns taking effect there. And while I'm doing these, I want to give a shout out to all the patrons that help make videos like this possible. Everybody on this list here has gone above and beyond to support Next Level Carpentry. Some of those patrons have been around for quite a while. Some of them are brand new, but everyone has used the link in the video description to go to Patreon and make a pledge of support that helps me justify the time it takes to film and edit, produce and upload videos like this. So I really appreciate it. You can see that gel poly just really makes that wood come alive. The nice thing about it is you can't put too much on or too little, just slather it on and let it soak in. It makes that grain jump out of there. And this cherry block is kind of cool because this is the way these pieces were cut off the block. You can see them go back together there and that turns into puzzle pieces. That's kind of cool. This oak should light up pretty well too. As those patron names go by, another way to support the channel is to use the PayPal link in the video description that takes you to the nextlevelcarpentry.shop website and a PayPal link. You can just click that if you're so inspired or you can just watch the videos and enjoy it for free. It's all up to you. The key to this gel poly is to just to swab the stuff on, 
Just give it as much as it'll take. I'll just continue to soak in until it doesn't. And last but not least, I'll swab some gel poly onto the maple block set also. This video sequence isn't really going to do justice to what's going on here. These colors really come alive with that smooth finish on the wood. These pieces are just amazing to hold. Smooth as silk, but brings out all the natural character of the wood. And remember, this is pallet wood, not some high dollar stuff that I had to buy somewhere. But it's just got that beautiful grain and character in it. And you see the way this was cut apart. Just keep going around with these pieces, 10 minutes or so. Just keep putting on as much as you can until it all soaks in, or until it kind of quits soaking in. You can tell how much that is. After about 10 minutes of rubbing and re-rubbing, all the excess gel poly is pretty well soaked into these blocks. I always pay extra attention on the end grain, even though that's sanded to 320 grit. It still wants to soak up the poly a little quicker. To get an idea how the sheen and the grain are coming out, on these as that gel poly starts to cure. If you're using the stuff and it gets real sticky because you took on too much or had to stop and take a phone call, you can just take fresh gel poly and rub it on there and it'll wake it back up so you don't end up with a glommy mess on the surface, which is kind of a nice feature. But the main reason I use it is because it just has such a wonderful look, feel, and sheen to it for a tactile piece like a puzzle like this that sits on a desk or a table and people are always picking it up to check it out. And it usually amazes them a little bit. They feel that wood for the first time. And I'll let that list of patrons close out with a final thank you for your support. As I take another dry paper towel, just kind of buff these pieces down to give them their final sheen and luster. You can see that in the camera. It's kind of nice sheen and luster. Just love the grain and the character of that wood. And I try to set these pieces down without touching them with my fingers so they can dry without fingerprints or smudges on them. It's no big deal if you get them on there. You can always sand it with a little bit of 400 and slap another coat of gel poly on there. But by setting them down that way, just touching the corners here, they have the best chance of curing with a nice even sheen. And I've purposely gone through the whole video without showing you how these puzzle pieces actually go together because I want you to kind of make the pieces and figure it out first because once you know how to solve the puzzle you can't really believe that when you hand the pieces to somebody else that they can't figure it out. It's kind of amazing the way the brain works. It's kind of like a magician's trick. Once you see it it's all over but until you do it's a complete mystery. That's what these blocks are like. So I'm just going to finish buffing these Get them all looking good and warn you ahead of time. I'll put a spoiler in the outro of the video that shows how to assemble these puzzles from these blocks. But this way, at least you're forewarned in case you want to try to work it out in your head ahead of time. So whether or not you go to the outro of the video and check out the spoiler, as always, until next time, thanks for watching. Unlike the rest of the video, I'll make this spoiler quick and easy. The way you solve these pyramid puzzles is to find the single square face on each of two identical blocks and place them together. If this doesn't solve the puzzle, rotate the two pieces 90 degrees relative to each other, and it does. I like to add this little four-sided pyramid piece You'll see how to make this one in the video too, as a red herring. Since it's four-sided and the puzzle pyramid is three-sided, it adds a subtle mental distraction that can throw off people who might otherwise solve the puzzle too quickly. You know the type, right? Well, there it is then. Good luck and have fun. And from Next Level Carpentry in 2020, I wish you all a peaceful, joyful, and very Merry Christmas. Thanks for watching to the end of the end of the end.